question now, uh, Professor Gailey. Thank you. This is on. I'm going to sit this presentation. Does everyone have a, a copy of the hand that I gave you, the list of selected provisions from state constitutions in New York from 1777 to the present? Well, I'm here certainly not because I'm a, a historian or student of the Irish in America, Catholics in America. Uh, I'm here primarily, I suppose, because I wrote a book on the constitutional history of New York. And uh, since that's my expertise, I thought I would focus on something that I could provide that would be most useful to the, con to the uh, conference, and that is to give you some idea of the trajectory of uh, constitutional, state constitutional treatment of religion and Catholics from the beginning till the end. So I hope that these provisions will be helpful in all of the panels that uh, we, uh, we, we find ourselves in for the next uh, uh, couple hours. Uh, so what I want to do is give you a thumbnail sketch of the treatment of religion, and that turns out to be mostly Catholic religion. That is, it's, it's ca Catholics that raise most of the issues involving the Constitution after 1777. They're directly or indirectly involved in these provisions. Now, the, the issue is rarely posed in those terms, in the debates or in the document itself. It's always put in the context of the larger question of preserving religious liberty and the principles embodied in the state constitution with things like no establishment and free exercise. Little attention until recently has been paid to state constitutions at all. Now, there are many lawyers who probably practicing in New York have never read the New York State Constitution. I mean, this is a, a tremendous difference between our focus on the national constitution and our neglect of state constitutions. But that's my hobby horse. I, well, I won't go into it uh, at this point. Uh, suffice to say that uh, one of the nice things about the people working in this field is they were forced or they were driven to look at these cases, these state cases, in some detail for the kind of information it might provide us. And so there has been a resurrection, not only among uh, state constitutional students, uh, both political scientists and, and lawyers, but among historians to work these cases over. And that's all to the good. So let's, let me go through these, making some comments uh, uh, along the way. It, the Constitution of 1777 has, uh, it, it obviously is the foundation document, and so you see a great many a provision, a number of provisions here. The first one, uh, Article 35, is the one that disestablishes the Church of England in the United States. You can see very clearly that, that while we accept the common law, I like the Americans because we had a sober re revolution, I mean, a revolution of sober expectations, unlike the French. And, and there's a great uh, Burkean flavor, I think, to a good deal of, of um, the early American understanding of constitutions. I mean, a great deal of the colonial institutions were simply uh, embodied in this new constitution. So we, we, need, we wanted to keep the common law. We wanted to make sure certain things were out. And clearly, what was going to be out was any established church. And so right off the bat, Article 35 does that. And then the, this is the most famous or infamous provision in 1777, Article 38. Uh, this is the one that uh, is largely the, the, the result of the proddings of John Jay, but also uh, of the, uh, the uh, bargaining or the debate that goes on between Livingston and Morris on one hand and Jay on the other with regard to how far they're going to go with this anti-Catholicism. So it, it says, notice, whereas we are required by the benevolent principles of rational liberty, which is a kind of enlightenment view, and clearly these phrases are, are loaded phrases. They have a, a certain meaning, not only to expel tyranny, but goes through the but the bigotry and ambition of weak and wicked prince, priests. Uh, Professor Welsh points out that uh, Samson, either through inadvertence or an, a, a printer's error, it put, leaves this stuff out because there's a, certainly ir a certain irony involved in quoting this passage to protect religious liberty for Catholics when in large measure the purpose was indeed anything but. So, uh, I, and, and Professor uh, Welsh quite carefully uh, refuses to make any definitive judgment in it, <laughs> but of course we all can make our own judgments about that, uh, a lawyer's brief. Uh, Article 39, uh, Here's the article that simply says, look, if you want to be a clergy, that's fine. But if you want to be a clergyman, you have to choose either uh, religion or politics. If you're going to be a clergyman, you can't run for office. 
And this is all part and parcel of this idea of uh, the concern uh, of these uh, writers of this Constitution about the extent to which religion might intrude itself upon the political realm. Uh, Article uh, 40. Uh, this one came up in the uh, discussion in the in the case. Yes, there was some discussion of it about the Quakers as an exception, and I in the Constitution of 1777, the exception is explicitly written in. It's not a, a court interpretation. The Constitution says that all such of the inhabitants of this state, being of the people called Quakers, as from scruples of conscience may be adverse to the bearing of arms, be therefore excused by the legislature and do pay to the states up sums of money. Now, now Samson uses it and they make them pay, you know, is this how, how, how much freedom is there uh, to do this? Well, uh, I, I just think that's quite misplaced. I think this is quite reasonable accommodation. If you can't kill, you do still owe some service to your country in some respect. We still do this today with conscientious objectors. They do alternate service or some kind. They're just not saying, well, you can go back to your uh, cappuccinos, you know, in, in the village, <laughs> something of that sort. So. Uh, and then the last one, again, it's also uh, clearly directed at a particular religion, uh, where on I, I bold it, I hope it's bold it in the, uh, I don't know whether it is, that the last part of it says, shall abjure and renounce all allegiance and subject to all and every foreign king, prince, potentate, and state in all <coughs> matters ecclesiastical as well as civil. This created a significant problems for Catholics and was aimed at Catholics. Uh, the kind of double barrel thing uh, that uh, Jason talks about, he talks about papist or, or, or citizen. In this case, papist, clearly. Because if you, if you are a papist, you, you're gonna have a hard time uh, taking this oath. In 1821, things begin to change. The, notice the religious toleration clause. Now, what happens here is the, uh, as I point out at the end, the whereas material is eliminated. That screed from J that was put in there is now simply expunged. And what you get is a pure, uh, pure, if you like that phrase, example of the of, of clause meant to give religious freedom to the citizens of the country. They continue this, the clergymen not eligible. Uh, notice what happens, however, to the militia, the Quakers here. Here, the, the movement, I'll jump ahead to the end of the story, the movement, the trajectory here is from the specific exception to the abstract or the generalized principle. You'll see this in the 1967 Constitution. Here they eliminate any reference to uh, Quakers and talk about any religious denomination, whatever, as from scruples of conscience may be adverse to bearing arms. So the principle is expanded from an exception to Quakers to any religious uh, uh, body. Uh, the common law is continued here, the, the same thing uh, in that one. So what we have here is a uh, the article involving the ecclesiastical oath is eliminated, and uh, the whereas material that Jay had inserted is also eliminated. Uh, finally, uh, in sec section one here, the official oath, it says very clearly, no oath, declaration, or test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust. Mm -hmm. So you see a significant change here in the 1821 Constitution, the convention. Then the next Constitution in New York, We've had nine constitutional conventions and four constitutions, I mean, and, and almost 250 amendments. Uh, we've been pretty busy here in, in New York. And uh, so this is a great depository of, of material to watch the layers of development that each generation leaves in the, wake, in the form of constitutional change. 1846, religious liberty, uh, uh, they, they keep that in there. Section four, article seven, prohibiting clergy from holding civil or military office is removed. So by 1846, a great deal has been accomplished with those, uh, uh, what we now consider offensive provisions, 1777. 1890, the war is a, is a watershed in terms of relationship between church and state because it's at this point that the issue of the constitutionality of aid to religious education, mainly Catholic, comes to the Constitution of New York. It had, it had been the tradition in New York, it's rather mixed and complicated, but by and large, the, the, the use of state aid had taken place in various forms in the late 18th and uh, uh, throughout most of the 19th century. Some laws preventing it, other areas allowing it. It's a rather complicated picture, but there was no clear uh, indication that aid never did go to these religious school schools. It did. And this provision, uh, 
I have two articles here. One of them is corporation charities. Notice what it does here in section nine. It makes it very clear that aid to these institutions, whether religious or not, is permitted. This is going to turn, I'm going to explain, this is a grand bargain or compromise that takes place in 1800 between allowing the charities, which are mostly Catholic, uh, the Elamocenary institutions, to continue to get aid and uh, to perform their duties, at the same time adopt this, what is so-called, I don't think it's, I think Green is right here, it's not particularly a Blaine Amendment, but this no aid to dom denominational uh, institutions in education. So it allows it here, and then it has two specific provisions about how this will work itself out. Look at section 14. Uh, it says, uh, whether under public or private control, uh, that's the key phrase here, allowing for this aid, payments by county, cities, towns, and villages to charitable, charitable elimocenary, correctional and reformatory institutions, wholly or partly under private control or care, support and maintenance may be authorized, but of course not required. Now, these are important passages for preserving uh, the power of the state of the, uh, uh, to provide state aid to these institutions. Somehow it wasn't as dangerous to aid religious institutions that were taking care of the poor and the blind and the, dumb and the like as it was to provide aid to education un unmitigated by uh, any of these other factors like charity and things of this sort. It was very difficult to, to argue against this, in fact, it, at the convention, although they did. So having accepted it in this area and with the church's approval, clearly the church's approval, the hierarchy, they accepted the no aid principle for education, at least not as a matter of justice, but as a matter of political compromise here. And so you get this famous provision in section four, no, uh, the, neither the state nor any subdivision thereof shall use its property or credit or any public money or authorize or permit either to be used directly or indirectly. They wanted to nail this down. Uh, in aid or maintenance other than for examination or inspection, any school or institution of learning wholly or in part under the control or direction of any religious denomination or in which I underline this, any denominational tenet or doctrine is taught. Now this gets into a fascinating area that I learned a lot about reading uh, Jason's book and Hamburger and, and others. This distinction between religion and denomination, between sect and religion, and it was an absolutely essential one to those people who wanted to not give aid to Catholic schools, but who wanted to, to maintain Bible reading and the other kind of what one would call generalized or generic Protestantism that characterized public schools in, in the United States, certainly through the 19th, and in some cases right up through the most of the, the 20th century. So uh, we have court decisions in New York that explicitly say that uh, there's a difference between denominations and this generalized Protestantism. That's okay, but the denominations like Baptists or Methodist Catholics, that's not okay. And it survived this, 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 the 19th century, at least in New York. In 1915, uh, this constitution was rejected, but here, notice what they did with the uh, conscientious objection clause. Subject, however, to such exemptions as are now or may hereafter be created by the laws of the United States or the led, it simply let the decision as to who would get exemptions, the legislature. Uh, and more generalized. Uh, 1938 was the next major convention in New York, and uh, they continued the no aid principle but in the middle of the convention, the, the Court of Appeals uh, handed down a decision, Judd versus Board of Education, in which they said busing of school children to parochial schools was unconstitutional. Now this has to be under the state constitution, you understand, because the, the national constitution, we've not, in, we've not incorporated the, uh, the establishment clause into the, uh, uh, towards the states. I think that, that took place in Everson. I think Everson is a decision that does that. So, the, in the middle of the Constitution, the, the uh, delegates noting that simply add to this provision, but the legislature may provide for the transportation of children to and from any school or institution of learning, overruling that decision. The last Constitutional Convention in New York uh, was the 1967, in some ways the most revolutionary. 
like that word, uh, or, uh, or modernizing constitutional convention we've had in this state. And the first thing they did, they removed that little Blaine Amendment. One of the most controversial things they did. Now you would think by then that the era of Roosevelt and uh, Cardinal Spellman with their controversy in 48 and Paul Blanchard's book, American Freedom and Catholic Power, and Joseph Blau's uh, uh, ostensibly academic, but in fact humanist uh, credo in 19, all these things took place in 1948. It was just, a lot of things were taking place. That that era was the high water mark of, of tension between Catholics and, and non-Catholics in the United States. Uh, and, and I think it, it was to some extent, but in this decision to take this away, it raised a firestorm. Now the question is why? This provision has never been, is not been interpreted by the court to give any more protection or to give any more separation of church and state than the First Amendment does. New Yorkers have simply made their peace with this issue by and large. We have come to accept the fact that we're a diverse state and to simply deny large groups of people on a, a principle that is of dubious origin, is, we're not going to do it. And so large amounts of aid in various forms is given to various religious groups and the political system has come to that accommodation. And the courts have accepted it in New York. So uh, the question is, what, why all the anger and the, the tremendous outcry about uh, removing this provision? There can be only one explanation, I think. I don't know the answer, but I suggest is, in spite of the fact that it doesn't give any more protection, it acts as a symbol for significant parts of the state of New York. It's symbolic politics, I think, at its most obvious that that outcry took place. Others may have a different explanation. But notice what the the, the, these, these uh, uh, delegates did. They replaced that with some fairly contemporary ideas. Equality of educational opportunity shall be guaranteed to all people of the state. The legislature shall provide the necessary programs to develop the educational potential of each person. In any law apportioning state aid to school districts, the basis of computing uh, total number of students shall be the registration thereof and shall take into account both the special educational needs, if any, et cetera, et cetera. And Two, discrimination in the admission to any school in the state supported in all or part by, by reason of race, religion, or national origin shall be prohibited. That was one of the reasons this constitution, which in many ways was far-sighted, was defeated by the voters. It made some other missteps too, and, and the decision of, of the head of the convention, the president, Anthony Travia, to submit all these changes as a lump. You take it or leave it. We think that had he put these things down as separate propositions. Much of the Constitution might have been passed and these more controversial ones may have been rejected, but we lost everything. And we've been struggling as a result with a Constitution that simply is a, like a Potemkin village. It bears no relationship to what happens in New York and for the most part. Thank you. <laughs>